If you set yourself up for being a genius because you sold a lot, you can be just so rocked and shattered. And in fact, looking at Kurt Vonnegut, we're going through Player Piano and Sirens of Titan and God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater. Those all sold 2,000 copies each. If you set up that standard, then he's not a very good writer, is he? The one on the ranch? Land, it's called Landman with Billy Bob Thornton. Yeah. Wow, very cool. Anyway, so whatever. You like the studio though? You're like one of the. I want Brady. No, I, I more than like it. I want Brady to come to my house and uh, and do a wall. Yeah. So where did, did you guys have these books? So a good chunk of them are like books that people sent, you know, yeah. like galleys and stuff. And then I my publisher sent me a bunch. And then then there's this company called Books by the Foot that like fills out like celebrity, uh, you books know, books by the foot. It's called Books by the Foot, and they do like. Movie sets, but then like, you know, if you're like a celebrity and you're about to be in Architectural Digest and you want to look like you read a lot of books, this is what you, you hire them and they, they'd be like, I want only cloth bound hardcovers <laughs> or you want only leather bound books. And so they can do whatever. So these are just filler. So it's like, it's kind of a lot of books that were very popular for a moment and then ended up. Yeah, right, like Re remaindered. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and, exactly. Uh, what I love, I, de I, I detected your hand in this, but maybe I'm wrong. But dead center in the middle of the other wall, yeah, is Battle Cry of Freedom. That's probably an. I accident. didn't. I thought figure that was you. No, I, some because of it's some literally chosen dead center. No, I, so one thing about it is the books get worse as it goes up. Because <laughs> after you get out of eyesight, then it's like all random cookbooks and stuff. Um, so some of them you'll see are really weird. It's like how to how to lose yeah, weight eating it, only it fruit. It almost doesn't matter to me. I mean, there's it all blends well, in. There's at some Tom point. Clancy, Garden yeah. Primer, Stephanie Meyer. I mean, right, Jermaine Greer. I mean, there's right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. And every once in a while, there'll be I'll be like, oh, that's a great. Like I, I picked some out. Like Evan Thomas's Sea of Thunder, I never read. And I was like, oh, I'm going to take that. I read that. That book was incredible. <laughs> there's a, oh, there's one of my... Did you ever read What I Saw at the Revolution by Peggy Noonan? No. Great I mean, book I, I about was, Reagan, the Reagan years by a conservative. A really interesting, great book. But anyway, yeah. You, Patricia Courtney, you saw you recognize most of these people. And then this, the other thing about the studio is this is Joan Didion's Table and Chairs. Literally? Literally. You mean from her an estate auction? Yeah. They sold a bunch of her stuff off when she died to raise money for Parkinson's, and that's what this is. Jesus. And, and that's and chairs. And chairs. There's a picture of her sitting in this chair, in these two chairs at one point. There's two over there is also. It in uh, LA, I assume, was the auction? Uh no, the auction was or in New York, York. So I don't New know York. if they shipped all the stuff to LA and then or from LA. She lived in both, but I guess she died, she lived in New York. So maybe it was in yep. a storage unit or something, but it's a cool vibe. You like it? Are you I kidding? have, a, Are you I have her desk chair. Fuck. It's a Joe that's, Didion's desk? Yeah, yeah that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, she was uh, one, of the, one of the best. She's one of the best. She's, Very few uh, people can do fiction and nonfiction as well as she can. She right. was like, uh, what is it, um, ambidextrous. She was, and she, I mean, if you just read the stuff in the White Album, it, it, it I don't feel this that often with nonfiction journalism, but I do with her, which is just that I can't do that. You know, mm -hmm. she, she's she's like she's so good, particularly combining the personal with the, with the other stuff. But I mean, she's just really good. Yeah, <laughs> you go like fuck. I can't I can't do that anyway. But I've had very few people inspire that feeling in me, but she does. So yes, and she's great. The the last two uh, Blue Nights and A Year of Magical Thinking. You're just like, how does someone take the worst things that it could have possibly happened to a person yeah. and transform it into something so profoundly good. Ugh. It's insane. So, hey, to, uh, speaking of L.A., because we're yeah. thinking of Joe, I, I, I associate Joan Didion with L.A., but yes. uh, do Goodbye you still have that. your like town in Bishop or where the fuck was it? Yeah, you? the ghost town? Yes. Yeah, the ghost town. You still Actually, have it? So I'll, sh I'll, I'll, show, I'll send you a link to the video. But in the other building, so it's, there's two buildings there, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the bookstore and then the other side is the record store. There, um, when we bought it, it came with a Brunswick bar, like, you know, Brunswick pool tables. Yeah. They, they got into the bar business after the pool business. And they made these bars. The last, the last year they made them was like 1917. So somewhere between like 1880s, early 1900s they made a bar and so 
The ghost town uh, was doing great. Then during the pandemic, the hotel burned down. I don't know if I told you this story. No, no. So uh, electrical fire, probably rats, oh, uh, burns down this uh, hotel that had been built, burned down to the day that it opened. Like, I think it opened in 1872. I can't do the math. But it was... Burned, like, to the ground. To the mm-hmm. ground. Nothing there. So the the process of the last couple of years has been rebuilding it. Yeah. And so Brent was just here. Brent's the one that was there. And he took the bar from the building, drove it all the way, and then it's they're building the hotel around the bar because the bar dates to when the original hotel would be there. That's really weird. Is the bar made out of slate or something? No, it's wood. It's like okay. it's like five or six pieces. Yeah. Um, it took forever to move, but um, wow. wow, wow, yeah. The go- the ghost towns uh, the ghost towns incredible. And we're <laughs> doing really a cool. he's he's doing a book about it, which should be fun, like all the history of it. Sounds great. It is near Bishop somewhere, right? Yeah, not uh, too far. Bishop, and uh, the closest town is Lone Pine. Lone Pine, yeah. Um, Lone Pine was. We, this is like it's so weird. I mean, obviously, this is what your book's about. When you like find something, and you're like, wait, that's how it was then. Lone Pine is the city at the bottom of the hill, and Lone Pine was the port city. Which would be like, how could there be a port city in the middle of? The yeah. desert, yes, and it's because Lake Owens was a lake then. Back then, and the 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 stuff would come down the yellow grade road on mm-hmm. by donkey, get on a boat, go across Lake Owens, and then by train to Los Angeles, and then if you've seen the movie Chinatown, that's where the lake went. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Well, Owens Lake was where all the water came from yeah. in L.A. Yes, but. Um, well, that's totally cool. I did not know that. So and, first and they stole all the sil- first they took all the silver out of the ground, and that sort of funded the building of Los Angeles as a town. Yeah. And then well, it's like the Giving Tree. After they took all the silver out of the ground, then they took all the water, <laughs> and then what's left is nothing. It's like <laughs> one of the most polluted places in the world. The lake is because they took all the they took all the water. Yeah. And then then the lake bed was there, and so all the stuff. So, anyways, now it's like. There's like it's an always, inch of water. I was going to say it's, a, it's not gone completely. They just put it's some of the so, and they just put some of the water back to yeah. do it. And then what's weird about it though is, it's it's almost like it gives you a sense. I guess it goes to your book, but like the the brute realities of like colonialism. This is like Owens Lake was like Los Angeles colonizing this other thing. Like the yeah. lake is owned by Los Angeles Water and Power, <laughs> even though it's three hours from Los Angeles County or whatever, they're just like, no, we still, this is ours. We we paid for this with blood, sweat, and tears. You deal with, like, we'll take all the stuff we want and then we'll leave you. I remember driving up whatever that road is that goes up the eastern slope where you see the the, the, the pumps and the the, yeah. the, 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 uh, the aqueducts coming mm-hmm. down and snaking over the hills and pumping, oh, and so pumping up this. From north thing. to south? Well, they're taking yeah. the, the, all the water they yeah. stole. They're yeah. taking all the way down to L.A. But yes. you can see it go down and the ladders going up and all this. And whatever. But, well, but, I, uh, it's pretty cool. My, 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 daughter, my daughter and her uh, boyfriend climbed Whitney yes. like, two years ago. So that was the... That was the State where we're talking about is the yes. sta- their staging area. Yes. For well, I think it's everybody's staging area, right? Who goes up? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I loved the new book. I I have an alternative subject or an alternative. And you and by the way, before we get going, yeah. you have a new book out right now or soon? Yes, uh, parenting book. Oh, cool. Yeah. Can you look, can I look, look of just look at? I'll give you one later. Yeah. Page a day. You have kids, I'm assuming. I do. Yes. How old? Uh, six and. Th- oh, about to turn four. Cool. Yeah. Um, How long has it been out, or is it just? It just a- came out uh, two weeks ago, I think. Okay. So been, you and I are in the same. We're in my the same pub cycle. Date, my pub date was May two, so. Yep, yeah, May two. Also me. Yeah. Well, I loved the book. My my, as I was reading it, the only uh, the phrase that kept coming back to me was that expression, "the triumph of hope over experience." <laughs> That's what it seems like, because the whole idea is insane. Like completely insane. Yeah, every every part of the Zeppelin slash what were the airships is what yes. they're, they're called. Well, rigid airships. I rigid mean, air. Just every part of it is delusional and insane, and contrary to any basic safety precaution. Like just that a human being would get in one of these things is deranged. It is. Isn't that yeah. amazing? So yeah. I mean, at some point you. I realize that I'm 
I mean, I'm normally writing a book about, or you know, Lord Thompson, R101 and the Imperial Airship Scheme and everything. But what I'm really writing a book about is human folly on yes. an absolutely enormous scale. And, that's, yes. and at some point in the middle, I, that wasn't what I thought going in. But somewhere in the middle, I go, oh, okay, I think that's the, what I'm doing. The encapsulation of the folly, to me, is in a single sentence in the book, when you talk about the asbestos-lined smoking lounge inside <laughs> R101. <laughs> that's you know <laughs> that what they were going to do is they were going to put all this stuff up in there you know and they and this is the first airship where they all put it inside they're going to put it all inside in the in the, in the glamorous dining room and cocktail lounges and promenades yeah. with the cell and windows and the smoking lounge which ironically one of the survivors there's only six <laughs> survived because he was smoke he was in there having a butt <laughs> <laughs> and having a drink in the smoking lounge, the asbestos actually protected him from the death. explosion. Well, that's just so for people who haven't read the book yet. We're talking about like a 700 foot hydrogen filled balloon in which the hydrogen is actually in stitched together cow intestines. Yes. So it's not any stronger than like a sausage you would get from Smitty's or something. It's, it's sausage casings. Yeah. yeah. So, so to, to a little background. So, what what I'm writing about here are rigid airships. It's just a thing. So, the Hindenburg, if we, everybody knows that, that's a rigid airship. And I'll, the difference is, so in the 18th century, uh, balloons were invented, right? So you would put air or hydrogen in them, and they would go up, which yeah. was a total miracle in a world where gravity ruled and everything else goes down, right? The you problem is you see the Earth from above a ground and not be on a mountain for the yes. first time in human history ever. Yeah. And uh, I mean, unless you were a bird, I guess. Yeah. But you, but they. The problem with balloons is that they, they went where the wind blew them, or where God <laughs> told them to go, or whatever it was. And also, they. Um, I mean, you you could use them as, let's say, as they were used in the Civil War and the Crimean War as observation balloons, whatever. But that was a problem. Nineteenth century, the French fixed this. They put a rudder on it and a propeller, and now you have a steerable balloon, right? Yeah. And by the way, a blimp and a balloon are things that don't have metal superstructures. Um, a rigid airship does. But anyway, so the 19th century, the French fixed this, and now we have a steerable balloon. French verb to steer or direct is diriger, and therefore something that is steerable is dirigeable, right? Yeah. Excuse my French accent, but dir uh, dirigible. So that's where it comes from. And then in 1900, Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin invented the rigid airship. Because uh, another problem with the balloons was that you couldn't lift that much. The, the amount of lift you had was entirely dependent on how much gas you had in the balloon. And so von Zeppelin came up with this idea that you would, in a 400-foot-plus airship, have a hard metal structure that could hold lots of big hydrogen gas bags. And so you could lift a lot of weight. And in his case, the reason to do that was to carry bombs so we could bomb the hell out yeah. of Europe. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So, so it's this giant balloon filled with incredibly flammable gas yes. powered by primitive, rough, uh, comparatively, gas or diesel engines. Right. They, in the, the, the airship that I'm writing about, uh, were, they actually were locomotive diesels. They were adapted. And the reason they just did the train cars just attached to the back. <laughs> or a, tra a, tra a train engine just tacked <laughs> so on there. What it, well, it was. Yeah. It was 650 horse diesel okay. engine. The reason they used them was because the airship was going to go to India and go through the tropics. And the, the, the belief was that, you know, gasoline fumes were, were flammable and had a, had a, a um, a relatively low flashpoint, I guess, but uh, diesel does not. Yeah. And so that was the, so they put all these diesels up in there. Uh, and again, this rigid airship with a metal skeleton covered by very thin cloth and then lifted by these gas bags that were made out of cattle intestines. So it was a weird combination of- Right, because the, the ship itself is not filled with the hydrogen, the balloons inside the ship Right, are so here, each one of these gas bags, think of a cheese wheel. Think of, in with, with the airship that I'm writing about, R101, uh, think of a cheese wheel 10 stories high, literally 10 stories high, made out of cattle intestines backed by a light film of cotton. And the, the ship has 17 of these stacked bow to stern, like just big cheese wheels going back <laughs> inside the hard metal st structure, which, you know, and this is what it, this 
could lift, you know, 100 tons. That was yeah. the idea. You know, if you take, just think of a recreational balloon. That can lift like you, me, and maybe one other person, the straw basket, basket yeah. that you're in, and that's it. You put 17 10 story or whatever, multi story gas bags together, you can start to lift a lot of weight. Yeah. And the reason I say it's the triumph of hope over experience is not just because it was this crazy idea once, but literally every single one of the balloons went down. Like it's, most it's, of them, not every single one, but he, uh, like a very, very high percentage. I, yeah. But over the hundred years, it's like, it, like they all go to zero. Like it, oh. <laughs> uh, uh, over the, the development period of the rigid airships, like they all, all end in disaster for the, like, there's, there's one smaller one, maybe. It's like the Graf Zeppelin you have yeah. that can fly. There's really only two that were successful. Yeah. Out of, of the, of the rigids, you're talking maybe, I don't know, 175 total that were built. Yeah. Um, and it, it was, it was a, it was a bad idea and it was a bad idea from the start. And, and, uh, so in that sense, my book is about a bad idea yes. and why it lived for 40 years. But when von Zeppelin first made these things, um, his idea was to, to they were weapons. They yeah. were going to bomb Europe. And in World War I, they did indeed bomb Europe. They became the world's first long range bombers. They became the world's first weapons of mass terror. The, they, they were the first time that any human being, which just goes back to a comment you made a minute ago, the first time that human beings understood that they could be annihilated from above by something mm. other than a thunderbolt yeah. were these Zeppelins. And they flew against seven European cities, mostly against England and London, and they bombed them. Yeah. People think the, the first bombing of London was World War II, but it wasn't. It was Zeppelins and World War. But these things were phenomenally vulnerable. I mean, they... If you have a let's say three or four or five or six acres of surface area and a fifty mile an hour wind hits it, it's very difficult to sing. And they're hard, not going fast. They're going sixty miles an hour. Yeah. And you they're, they're hard to navigate. They get blown all over the place. They blow up very easily. And one of the things that happened in World War One was that the British figured out what would happen if a fighter plane shot a an incendiary bullet yes. into the hydrogen, which is a very satisfying experience from the pilot's point right. of view, because you have something, there was this techno race to see who could fly higher because the Zeppelins kept trying to go higher, 12,000, 14, 17, 18, 20,000, even 26,000 feet to get away from the British. Yeah. And this went on, but they lost invariably. And what would happen is you, <laughs> the people down below would see these 600 foot things coming down slowly and looking exactly like the Hindenburg, the yeah. film that we all, it was looking yeah. like that coming slowly to earth. And the German, the, the poor German soldiers in them, uh, the airmen, uh, they didn't have parachutes because yeah. that would weigh too much. So as soon as the British fighter hit and they saw the spark, is you had the choice, jump or burn. You, that was your choice. Yeah, we were just at the, actually yesterday we were at the, um, the Pacific Museum in Fredericksburg, the World War II uh, Museum, and they had this game where you could do, uh, you could practice being an anti-aircraft gun against, you know, um, ships. And so my six-year-old was playing it, and he was like not great at it because he's six, but I was just thinking like, he could probably hit a 500-foot <laughs> balloon in the yeah. sky. <laughs> like, well, you just think, it's not just like... Uh, Kind of a big target. It's like the biggest target it's you could imagine. Biggest target. Imagine if you could sink the Titanic with one bullet from very far away, and it's just and it can't turn around. I mean, it's, it's it was like an, it was absurd. an amazing moment in warfare, and it, it demonstrated how but what a bad idea Zeppelins were. But in the in the techno race to see who could fly higher. And the, the Germans were just slightly ahead. And then the British, of course, the British planes would have to circle to get up to 10,000 first and then 14 and then 18,000 feet. But when you got up there, these are unprotected human beings yeah. at 18,000 feet in wintertime. Yeah. So we're at 30 below zero, 40 below zero. People are freezing. They're, there's, uh, they're, they're, they're dying for lack of oxygen. They've got terrible frostbite. Their gauges are all freezing up. Their compasses are frozen. Their oil lines are frozen, everything. And they're up there. Uh, and British pilots also, yeah. because the British pilots are equally unprotected in these little bi you know, biplanes going up to try to pursue this, as you say, these 650, 700 foot long Zeppelins up there. And, uh, and it was this amazing piece of warfare. Um, and it went on during, uh, it went on for the most of a uh, World War I. And, um, and 
almost, I mean, the Zeppelins, I like 70% of them were lost in combat to, into fire. And I mean, it just was, a, it was gruesome. Yeah. I mean, you're saying it was, it was such an obviously bad idea, but it was like the world was over and over again going, this is not a good idea. And then people were like, but what if, yeah. you know, just like over and over and over again, not getting the message, which I just found endlessly fascinating. It's pretty amazing because you come out of the war, World War I, where the German Zeppelins have failed miserably. Yeah. And you'd think, well, okay, that's the end of those things. Okay, but no, actually, the, there's a lot of nationalism and national pride swept up into these yeah. things. They're kind of equal parts engineering and ideology. And so after the war, you think, well, okay, they're gone. And, and after the war, the Germans were shut down. They were not allowed to fly yeah. them anymore. Yeah. But the British say, aha, we can, do this better than, <laughs> we can do this better than those guys. We're going to bring British technology to bear. And so in 1921, you have this, uh, you know, this attempt to fly the biggest and best in the world, the R-38, which goes down in flames. However, there, there were a few, it, it wasn't uniformly awful. I mean, there were a few examples and that everybody could point to and say, look, see, it, they work. I'll give you a good one. 1919, the only way the British could get, really build uh, an airship, a rigid airship, was to copy down Zeppelin. So when a Zeppelin went down, the engineers would crawl all over <laughs> the thing, and they'd come on to reverse engineer it or figure out how they did it. But of course, by the time they got their airship, it were, they were years behind the Germans who were now on to height climbers that could go to 24,000 feet. But after the war, the, the British had was one that they were very proud of, that there was a, not, was a straight Zeppelin knockoff called R-34. And the, these are really boring names, you know, rigid, R for rigid, 34. And they were sitting there going, okay, we got this, this uh, 600 and whatever foot airship and there's no war anymore. We've got a great pilot named Herbert Scott. And he said, so let's fly it across the Atlantic, they yeah. said. Which I had no business doing. This thing yeah. had no. It was be, it was meant to be a height climber, meaning something that could climb away from the German fighter, or the English fighter planes. But it wasn't built to go across an ocean. They take it across the ocean. They've got so many near accidents; it's ridiculous. But they fly it across the ocean, and you know, in 1919, it was the first east-west crossing. East-west is the hard way, right? Yeah. Going against the wind, right? West to east, which is what Lindbergh did eight years later. We're eight years in advance of Lindbergh. First east-west crossing, then they flew it back. First double crossing of the Atlantic. And Herbert Scott was the pilot, and it was a British airship, and he was this global hero. Yeah. Completely forgotten now, and I would say because he was overwritten by Lindbergh, as so many other people. You know, you don't remember, people don't remember Alcock and Brown either, who were the first transatlantic crossing. Who are those guys? Who's Herbert Scott? Lindbergh, we all know. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so the point is, a British airship crossed the Atlantic twice in 1919. Yeah. Eight years there must before be something Lindbergh. There. Yeah, there was always that little glimmer of something. Well, you know, these the Germans ran this little kind of fake airline before World War One, and they didn't have any deaths, and it must mean that it really works. And it just kind of, as you were saying, it sort of hope springs eternal. Yeah. It, even in the face of every evidence that the thing isn't going to work. Well, you have a Latin expression. I think you said it's the motto of the RAF, something about, what was it? Uh, Ad astra per ardua? Yeah, basically through adversity to the to stars. The, stars. So the, the whole point of doing something really hard is that you have to push through all this evidence that it's impossible. Yeah. I was thinking of that other quote about how like progress depends on the irrational man. Do you know that one? No. It's basically like a rational person Wouldn't do adapts that. themselves to the world, yes. and an irrational person adapts the world to themselves. Right. And so like... A Flying. rational person isn't getting into the X1. Yeah. Chuck Yeager did. Yes. Like, right, also isn't getting right. on the Wright's biplane, which is or the Wright's insane. Biplane. Right, right, so right. it's like, it's this weird thing where it selects the industry of pioneering and groundbreaking. Uh, you're inherently irrational people that ignore all the reasons you shouldn't do it. Right. And sometimes it works, but then sometimes you really are going down a blind alley. Yeah, and in this case, what happens is this, you know, look at the development of the airplane. And I mean, you had to be crazy to get in those early airplanes, and they crashed at enormous rates, but they persevered. And because the fundamental idea was sound, eventually wing loading and engine yeah. tech and all this stuff made it possible, and, and just safety made it possible to have commercial airline service. The You could look at the, the 40 years of the rigid airship. Um, from Count von Zeppelin's introduction, essentially to just beyond the Hindenburg. And it was the same thing, except the idea was fundamentally flawed. Yeah. There was another thing going on there too, Ryan, which is that in those years, particularly after the war, 
it was just a different standard of risk. Yeah. So nowadays, or somebody wrote this later, you know, was, was writing from the 50s or something, saying, you know, nowadays a captain who chooses not to fly into a storm is kind of patted on the head, good boy, yeah. you, good, you didn't take a risk, you didn't endanger whatever. And But back then it was, you, you were expected to fly into the storm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the RAF pilots, the early RAF pilots, didn't even bother to look at the weather. They just went up and hoped that it was going to be okay. Right. And there was this idea that risk, um, that a far higher, I guess, threshold of risk was acceptable th- than it is now to us. And and so what might look like idiocy or straight folly isn't, on some level, is is a, a willingness to accept a level of risk that we're not. And as you, but I think you put it really well, though. That's it is the, you, you stumble forward this way and you would never make any progress at all. And who knows, maybe the rigid airship idea was the world's greatest idea. <laughs> but... But because they're going to, they prove that it wasn't. <laughs> but well, I was just anyway. thinking, even as an author, right? It's like you think this is a good idea, and then you're going, you're going, and there, you have to be at some level a glutton for punishment. You have to be at some level irrational. You have to be some level, uh, you know, believe you're smarter than everyone else, or you would never. No books would ever be published. And yet, the key, really, the key differentiator is is knowing when you've got a good idea or a bad idea, and that's so hard to distinguish. There's a certain, I mean, one of my favorite books that I've written, my personal, is a book that you you and I have discussed, my a biography of Stonewall Jackson. Mm-hmm. S- embarking on a 680-page biography of Stonewall Jackson without having any Civil War background is insane. Yeah. I now know. Yes. <laughs> and as my wife said, if he had lived to uh, Gettysburg, we'd be divorced now. But yeah. he didn't, so I didn't have to do, uh, research Gettysburg. But there's an act of faith yeah. to jump off. And what Gwynn thinks he can do, a biography of Stonewall Jackson? Well, I did do it, but I, I, I really don't know how. But I, it, I mean, I, all rationality should have said, don't do that. I mean, seriously. We do were, a book about... Some modern politician. Your your other Civil War book, uh, The Hymn of the Republic, is is interesting to me because you look at Grant. What is Grant's secret weapon? It's that he doesn't quit. He just keeps going, even though everyone says it's a bad yeah. idea. Even though they're stacking up the bodies, you yeah. know, and the the statistics are ghastly, uh, unfathomably bad. And he's just like, no, this is the way to do it. I'm going to fight it out on this line. And so that is this sort of key variable of success in basically any domain, yeah. but it's also what makes you get in a 700-foot-long hydrogen-filled it's balloon it's very against good, all warnings. Very good observation. Uh, I think it's... And Grant, too, in his personal life, he didn't take the lesson that everybody else would. I mean, everything that happened to him in his life was a failure, and yeah. he failed in business again and again and again, and he, just, it got, he was selling firewood in the streets of St. Louis. And mm-hmm. he was working as a lowly clerk in his father's tannery store a, m- a month before the Civil War began. He didn't take the lesson he should have, which is you can't do this. Yes. Just as at Cold Harbor, he didn't, or wherever, wilderness, he didn't yeah. take the lesson, which is that, okay, there's too many people dead, we can't do this. Yeah. He he took the other lesson, and the, the lesson he took was that he could do it. Yeah. Uh, really, it's the most astonishing thing about him. And uh, a rational person, perhaps, yeah. wouldn't have done that. Yeah, and then can you turn that off? Right or like because it it he he happened to be right there and wrong pretty much everywhere else, and in this case, uh, perseverance through all the doubt is what makes the airplane work. It's what makes all these other breakthroughs work. Uh, it's just not with the rigid airships. But what's also interesting about it is like simultaneously there are all these other breaks. Like this is happening not that far from say the invention of atomic weapons or, yeah. all, you know, like this wasn't happening in the 1800s and they had some right. like totally primitive sense or no. whatever. This was simultaneous with a lot of yeah. other much more rational, uh, reasonable, iterative breakthroughs. And there was evidence along the way that those things were working. Whereas here, it was the preponderance of evidence Right. Every single day that they were just disregarding over and over and over again. Yeah, and it's uh, one of the amazing things about it. About so the the book is about really it's about this this great airship R one hundred and one, which was at the time that it flew the largest object that had ever flown, bigger by volume than the Titanic. Um, it was uh, 
it was part of what was known as the Imperial Airship Scheme, which was the British attempt to populate the skies of empire. They had this, it came out of World War I with this giant empire. I mean, 25% of the world's land mass, 420 million people. And they won, and they, they, but they were, they were on, they were declining. The yeah. British techno, technological advantages and political advantages were declining. And they kind of looked out over this vast empire and they said, you know, we could stitch this all together in ways that no one's ever seen before, right? We could, we could compress the space-time continuum. So India, instead of 13 days, is four days. Australia, instead of 30, is 11 days. I mean, 30 to 11 days to yeah. Australia from England. It's not so unwieldy anymore. Is radical. So you're going you're to stretch this empire. You're going to connect it, rather, South Africa and Egypt and New Zealand and Australia and Canada and all these places, right, and India, and you're going to connect it all together. And this was the great imperial airship scheme. And th this goes right to the heart of what you were saying, which is that in when it was hatched in 1924, 1925, there were a total of two rigid airships flying in the world. Yeah. Okay, it gets to your point where, where are they all? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they're, not, they're gone. Yeah. They chose this exact moment to launch what was going to be this glorious, um, uh, uh, and not only was it going to connect the, the British, this new gigantic British empire, but the thing that was going to connect it would be British technology. Yeah. Because the Germans had been put out of business. I mean, the Treaty of Versailles put them out of business. They weren't allowed to do this. So it's now going to be British technology up there, and, it, and it, which goes back to, look at the 19th century and why, you know, what were the British advantages? They were, they were the kings of like the greased piston. Yeah. They built boats and ships better than anybody and they had bigger guns and they had faster machines and this global sea power that they built. And what they wanted to do was, this was going to be air power, if yeah. you will. The tech, British technology in the air now, a uh, different type. No, no longer the grease piston and the giant gun, but... Uh, and who was the main guy, Lord Thompson? Lord Thompson, yes, it was well, his vision. Oh, it struck me too that there's like, you know, they say there's oh, there's always the reason and then there's the real reason. Yeah. There's like behind every harebrained scheme, there <laughs> is some profoundly human reason for doing it. Um, like I, I, I was reading uh, about... Elon Musk buying Twitter and there's this like moment where like his ex-wife texts him and she's like, they've banned the Babylon Bee, like this shitty conservative satire account. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, did he buy, did he spend $44 billion <laughs> to like impress his ex-wife? Impress his girlfriend. And, and, and uh, <laughs> there's this part in the book where it basically sounds like he just wants to impress this princess that he's in love with. It is. And that's why he's forcing like, the, the trip itself may have worked, just not in the specific timeline that they set up in the specific weather that they met. Right. And so why is he forcing it? There's no real political reason, financial reason at the end of the day. It's like he wants to be back in time to like see this woman or something. Like there, there yeah. is this, the real reason is so pedestrian at the end of the day. There were, so so what happens, the book, I mean, I'm not spoiling anything because yeah. I say it in the cover, the ship has a horrendous crash that <laughs> uh, looked just like the Hindenburg. But, it, you know, it, the reason it happens is because it's driven, it's pushed by Lord Thompson to take off on October 4th, 1930, which, as you say, it doesn't have to. Yeah. Or why does it have to? It's a complex reason, and, and, and there is a woman in the middle of it, as you say. So what it is, is what, what Lord Thompson wants to do is take this untried, largely untested airship. He's going to fly it to India, one stop in Egypt to Karachi, which was back then in India, turn around and fly it back, 10,000 miles round trip. He's going to step off this airship, trailing clouds of glory, walk into the Imperial Conference, which was then all the grandees of the British Empire, meeting in London. He's going to walk into the conference, and he's going to give a speech on the future of air travel, having just proved that it was viable, yeah. right? Which was, okay, a fundamental reason to push it. But just below that reason is, that, say, why? what are the other advantages of having a four-day trip between India and Europe? Well, his girlfriend, the Romanian princess, the vastly wealthy Martha Babesco, toast of literary Paris, um, you know, who has two palaces, uh, suddenly he's closer to her. Yeah. And not only that, but he's about to be given, which no one knows, uh, in fact, until my book, really no one explored this much, he was about to be given the Viceroyship of India. Yeah. Okay, the Viceroyship of India, you would rule over 320 million people. Uh, you would uh, live in a 200,000 square foot, 340 room palace, the largest residence of any head of state in the world. And you would be 
the head of India, which is, of course, the key part of the British Empire because it's seething with revolution and discontent. And There's and this he, guy, Gandhi, who's causing problems for Gandhi, you. Gandhi, the Indian National Congress, all in the ascendant. Yeah. And we yeah. don't know, in 17 years, India is going to be is gone from yeah. the British Empire. But so all these reasons, um, he his history with Martha Babesco was he meets her when he's a, mil a lowly military attache in, in Bucharest during the war. She's this glamorous princess. Again, the toast of Paris. Marcel Proust is writing poems to her. He's this lowly guy and a military lifer. And to some extent, the next X number of years are him trying to impress her yeah. with, how, with how cool he is or how powerful he is. She's drawn to power and wealth and money. He doesn't have any of those things, but he's about to get them all. He, he, he got the cabinet job as Secretary of State for Air, wonderful Shakespearean title, and now he's going to get the Viceroyship of India, the, the, basically the largest job in the British Empire and one of the largest jobs in the world. And it is very much angled at impressing Marta Babesco. So you have this kind of tiered reasoning. Um, it's very which... Gatsby-esque. Yeah, it is. It's, 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 it's the green the, light. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's like Gatsby gets in a balloon and tries to do the impossible and then ends up dead in the swimming pool. You know, it's <laughs> it's like... true. It's true because, uh, yeah, uh, Thompson was doing it himself, so he never made it. Yeah, it's uh, it's just absurd. So is the, uh, I heard once that the, the, the point on the top of the Empire State Building was supposed to be a landing dock for Zeppelins. Is that true? I think, I, was it there or the Chrysler? Or like, one of them, right? That's why yeah. they had those points? Because yeah, you mentioned I, yeah, the landing true. towers. It's, 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 it's true. Yeah, I think that there was an idea that they could do that. That never. I don't think that, boy, that would have been weird. But yes, it, but, because masts were what airships, the Germans never used masts, but the British did and the Americans did. So you would put up a mast of let's say 200 feet and the airship could dock at the mast and then there'd be a stairway to come down and i think that's what the empire state building had because it's such an absurd idea you don't even think about it but yeah you can't land a fabric ship going 60 miles like it's no. not like an airplane that just no, and you, then you apply the brakes yeah. like it, the only way you can crash the only way you can land a 770 foot airship that is covered with very thin linen and full of hydrogen is when there's absolutely no wind at all yeah one of the problems with airships was that it, unlike aircraft or boats you there you can't land them in a storm <laughs> So if you're up in the storm, you can't go down because what, let's say, so R101, uh, the, the, the subject of my book, has six acres of surface area. Okay, now let's take a 50 mile an hour wind. Now, if you've ever sailed a sunfish and le or a very small sailboat, you see what a, a puff of wind does to a small sail? Yeah. Okay, now think six acres, 50 yeah. miles an hour wind. What happens to them when you take them down with wind is the wind just beats them to pieces across the landscape and then a spark hits it and then they blow up. Yeah. Static electricity. It doesn't have to be shot by a bullet, just static oh, no. electricity. Uh, yeah. if, if, you're, if you're being sort of smashed around the landscape and smashed into your hangar and into the mast and all that stuff. So these guys couldn't go down. And uh, I mean, theoretically anyway, a boat can go into a safe harbor and theoretically anyway, a, a plane can go down and land. Um, but these guys couldn't. There was actually a really gruesome moment. Um, this was a, the Americans figured out helium airships. And the reason they figured them out is because they had helium. Yeah. And they wouldn't give it to the Germans. Um, the helium was all in like Amarillo. Right? Yeah. And, uh, and uh, I always thought it would be funny to like do a skit on what people sounded like down in a helium mine, you know, yeah. when they were, how they talked to each other. But anyway, we had the helium. They didn't have the helium. Um, uh, and so the, there was this joint venture company between Goodyear and the Zeppelin company, they built these two huge airships, one of which was called the Akron. And the Akron, helium filled, so they thought, hey, can't blow up. Gee, this is great. We know we, yeah. this thing's going to be safe. But it has the, it has the problem that, that all airships have many uh, shared problems that are independent of hydrogen, but one of them is this problem of landing in a storm. Yeah. So the thing's in, off New Jersey... And it's these terrible thunderstorms that come. And thunderstorms are the worst of all because you have up and down drafts. Yeah. So these things go shooting up 5,000 feet, then doing a nose stand at 6,000 feet, then a tail stand at... None I mean, of this, this sounds is, real. Like, like, so they're, bat, they're, off, they're off the shore of the off New Jersey coast, and they're being chased by thunderstorms, and they go west to try to get away, then east and south. And for four hours, they flee because they can't go down. Eventually, they get caught in a downdraft that just jams them into the... 38 degree water in, in the North Atlantic and 
and that's it. 73 of 76 people die. But yeah, it was yet another, you know, vulnerable to wind, vulnerable to hydrogen, vulnerable to all these things, but can't land in a storm is a big one. Well, one, one more thought on uh, the triumph of hope over experience, which struck me probably as the most absurd thing in all of it. And I don't think this is spoilers, but some of the people who died in R101 had been in the other terrible crashes, yes. which proved definitively <laughs> that this was a totally unworkable uh-huh. idea. And the thing they got in was no better or different. It was no changes very have been similar. Made. Both giant hydrogen-filled airships. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we don't so, learn. So, we yes. never learn. But I think the point you bring up is is really good. And I, you know, I, I it it is, it is it is the process of technology and the process of invention. Yeah, uh, is basically. Um, I mean, I think of it sometimes as forgetfulness, because if you really, if anybody, for example, who went up in a commercial airliner in 1929 or 1930, you're taking your life in your hands. So yeah. somehow you have to forget about the yeah. fact that 52 of them went down the year before yeah. and think, oh no, this is going to be great. Right. I mean, it's really important. It's an important way that humans evolve and, and particularly technology. So, But I mean, one of them is not made of, Bed sheets. <laughs> That's true. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, the, and the, cattle intestines. The, the, the features of the other things are also designed to reassure, right? It's like, I get it, you're on the Titanic and then you go in another boat. Yeah. It's different than, <laughs> you know. Oh. The, uh, the other thing that struck me about the book was, speaking of, you know, the Empire State Building having the landing dock or whatever, there's something similar to like the Great Influenza or, or some events in history where it's like, it's so insane, it's so tragic, it was so widespread, and then it just disappears totally from history because it's so embarrassing and inexplicable maybe that we just don't, or tragic, that we just don't want to talk about it and it's better that we just excise this from history. Like, I guess going into your book, I was like, the Hindenburg crashed, that was obviously the only one of them, and the only time That's it That's all happened. anybody knows. Yeah. It, it has been. It's been overwritten, expunged, whatever the word is. It's the. I mean, who's ever heard of the R101 or R34, the one that crossed the... There's l- hundreds l- of them? L- like, that, who, whoever knew that, you know, the dozens and dozens of, of, of giant Zeppelins went down in, in Hindenburg-like fireballs during World War One. Yeah. N- nobody knows these things. And it, it's it's interesting that um, that it can sort of all be overwritten in that way. The Hindenburg you bring up, which is interesting, because that is everyone's marker. Yeah. Because everyone knows what that is. Yeah. And it's interesting, the reason they know is because there was, when it happened at Lakehurst, New Jersey in 1937, seven years after R1, R101 went down, when it happened. At that time, there was a guy with a, a film company called Pathé who was shooting silent film. And that's the thing that the world saw. Yeah. That 30 seconds in the most incredible, I mean, it was the most incredible thing anyone had ever seen. It, it played in movie theaters all over the world silently because there was no sound with it at all. Yeah. Meanwhile, there's a guy from the AP over like, somewhere else who's going, oh, the humanity, oh no, it's going, oh, like that guy, right? Yeah. So so uh, sometime in the 1960s, I think it was in the 60s, some enterprising British producer married the sound oh. with the with the... So now you've got the full thing going up in flames and the guy saying, oh, the humanity. Those weren't, yeah. th- those didn't occur in the same spot at the same time. But it's such a big kind of deal. And the, one of the interesting things about it is it, it, it was the only time anybody ever really saw this happen. Yeah. So R101 goes up like this. You know, as I say, dozens, I don't know, more than 70 in World War I go up this way. A whole bunch before World War I go up this way. Uh, the American ships, uh, the, the uh, I'm sorry, the... Uh, the, the first, well, R-38, the first American ship, and then the Roma, the Italian ship that the Americans, all go over these giant hydrogen, it's like nothing but giant hydrogen fireballs, yeah. but nobody saw them. Yeah. Uh, and so you have this weird kind of, it's this era that lasts about 40 years, 1900 to just before World War II, and it disappears because these things didn't work. Now, you'll, you'll see the Goodyear blimp, or the Fuji blimp or something. They're, they are blimps, though. They're balloons. Yeah. You pump them up full of gas, and they, they may have a rigid keel on the bottom, but they don't, they're not that big. They're a couple hundred yeah. feet long, and they don't, actually, the new, the new generation of them, the airlanders, they're going to take people to the North Pole for $500,000, which 
I don't think I'm getting on that plane. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, allegedly now you, they, learned, these, you learned some lessons. These things can take off yeah. with Bernoulli's principle, and they can, and they have surface area which isn't as vulnerable to wind. But yeah, if you got an extra five hundred thousand, go to go uh, to the poll. After reading your book, I'm not going anywhere near <laughs> a blimp of any kind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just, it, the whole the whole thing is just so fascinating and so uniquely human that this is yeah. just like what we what we do. This is this is this is history just in a particularly absurd way. Yeah, it's uh it's just a history of a bad idea basically, but but it you never would have known at the moment that the British launched their imperial airship scheme, it, all systems go, everything was forgotten. And then also, the, also part of the technological advance is that this time we're going to get it right. You know, yeah. we're going to make this thing bloody invulnerable in the same way that I think, you know, two decades before was the Titanic. Yeah. They kind of thought it was indestructible too. And the, and the R101 people, the more they did, the more they put their diesels up and the more they put their smoking lounges in or whatever they did and all the things that they tried to do, they made it four times stronger than it needed to be in its superstructure. They just became convinced that it was... I mean, otherwise they never would have done it. They were convinced that this baby, as Lord Thompson, who was the driving guy behind this, he said, it's as safe as a house, but for the millionth chance. I mean, what? And then he said, and then Your he said- Your house is filled with hydrogen yeah, and you smoke a lot. <laughs> yeah. And then he had another said, he said, he said it was an all weather aircraft. Okay, wait, all it's weather? the opposite of that. So like a typhoon or a, a tornado, uh, I mean, you know, a 70 mile an hour wind, uh, these things, they, they came to believe. And I don't know, I'm not a Titanic historian, but I think there was a sense that you could make a, a ship indestructible. Well, I, uh, Wright Thompson was in here a couple of weeks ago and we were talking about Walter Lord's book, uh, A Night to Remember. Mm, great and book. it's like the Titanic was unsinkable, except if the captain repeatedly ignores warnings about <laughs> icebergs and then doesn't hit an iceberg, but scrapes alongside an iceberg for two or three hundred feet. I mean, yes, it's unsinkable for, for ordinary things, but it's not unsinkable for gross recklessness and negligence. <laughs> and, and it's like the airships could do the job. I mean, they'd seen it, but that was when, when ev everything went right. And in this case, not only did everything not go right, but they repeatedly ignored warnings that this was a bad idea. And then just to put a little caveat in here, which you talk about in the book, the the main guy's also probably drunk. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> Herbert Scott. Herbert Scott, the hero of, of R-34, was that great British airship that crossed the Atlantic, yeah. the Zeppelin knockoff. That was Herbert Scott. The most glorious pilot of the of his day. Yeah, I mean, he wasn't a he, he was an airship pilot, but not an airplane pilot. But um, yeah, Herbert Scott was was drunk when when she left. But it it uh, anyway, the whole thing is kind of a tale of folly, but it's very earnest folly, and they're yeah. trying very very hard. Yes, and um, you know, and as you said, there 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 were. I, you know, I don't know when you're d designing the Titanic where you get to the moment where somebody says, well, why do we really need to seal off those individual bulkheads? Why don't we just not use sealable bulkheads? Because why would we ever need the sealable bulkheads? You know, you really need lifeboats for everyone. You know, <laughs> that's right. You go, I don't know at what moment, the, you know, where you get to that point and you go, well, you know, uh, gee. Do, well, do you think part of the reason we were talking about the risk tolerance and that you were saying, like, in this time, People did crazy things all the time, so it's hard to get a sense of what was truly crazy. But I think what happens with the Hindenburg is then you see it, and so it's so obviously crazy when you see it on fire, yeah. where each of these individual crashes in a world before truly mass media, it's terrifying and insane to the 20 people that watch it happen, and to the, it, it's vivid to the people who can read or who, you know. But there's the, no image. Yeah, there's no image. And yeah, the best writer can only do so good at capturing right. what truly happened. And then with mass media happening just a couple years later, we're starting to go, hey, let's make sure pilots aren't drunk before they fly us. Or, you know, these right. just basic safety precautions that before we were either afraid to ask or too dumb to consider. Yeah. And that kind of goes away. It's not safetyism so much as just basic common sense that 
the accountability of people writing and uh, of the sto- of what happened being widely known after that forces people to just operate on a different level of professional competence. Yeah. Because if you had, I mean, if you had seen all of the, I, I can't even, uh, 70 or whatever uh, hi- ships that went up in hydrogen fireballs. Yeah. And this is pre-war, peacetime, post-war, including the uh, Zeppelin issues during the war. If you had seen that, yeah. or if people had seen film of it, yeah. the entire approach would have been different, but yeah. no one saw any of it. Yeah. It was like Zeppelin goes down in over channel. Okay. Yeah. You know, whatever. That wasn't you the that the immediacy of watching the Hindenburg is seeing what hydrogen does. Yeah. And and one of the things that was disturbing about the Hindenburg, which is that the Germans afterward just insisted that they had done everything right, absolutely everything. They had no, nothing wrong. There was the approach was good, the turn was good, it was perfect. I'm going, dude, if that's <laughs> you know, if that's perfect. Oh, good yeah. for you, but yeah. I'm not getting on that thing because that means you have no idea what it was that caused right. it. And that was a realm of possibility that yeah. it could go down. Like, you know, it's it's insane. So when you do a book like this, I, I, I'd be curious, like uh, Empire of the Summer Moon was such a monster hit and it's so good and it's the perfect story. Are you able to just put that out of your mind and tackle each project independently or is that something that kind of hovers above you? Empire. Yeah. Uh, in some ways, the the uh, in some ways there's there's a there are there is a parallel in the structure of this book and Empire. So one of the things that I uh, with Empire the Summer Moon um, decided to do, which actually makes the book work, um, and what I do is I alternate chapters. So there's one chapter which is we're way back in time with the Spanish and the development yeah. of the horse and whatever. And the next chapter is essentially current time, 19th yeah. century, little uh, nine-year-old girl with, with cornflower blue eyes gets gets kidnapped by Indians in Texas. And it's the story of the Parker family. So we're alternating chapters, the backstory, right. uh, history of Texas, history of whatever, and, and, the, um, and, uh, and, the, and the rise of the Comanches. And then the front story is this, this is the Parker family. So you're never very far from the family. Mm. And the, the miracle of, of that book, which I only realized when it happened, was... I'm going, okay, alternate, 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 and then suddenly it's Quana and the tracks just run together. Yeah. I, I went, oh. Yeah. <laughs> because in, in the person of Quana, the entire backstory sure. and the, the small family story unify. Right. It was, I mean, when I realized, I mean, I'm not claiming to be brilliant because I, I didn't know that's where it was going. Sure. But when I got there, I thought, oh, okay, well, yeah. then that's, that's what I've done. So in this book, um, the, the, ch- the, the challenge was, okay, you've got a crash on the night of October 5th, 1930, <clears throat> of an airship. Um, and so, and that's about a seven-hour flight before that happens. And so how am I going to do this? Am I going to start with kind of a scene setter just before the, you know, the thing takes off or something, or maybe it's in the air, and then kind of go all the way back and just tell that kind of backstory from start to finish, right? Um, from the earliest Zeppelins to the crash. And I thought that was making the reader wait too long to come yeah, back sure. to the material. And so what I did was, again, alternating chapters. And we're, we're on the airship, which the reader knows he's yeah. on the Lusitania. We're on the Lusitania. <laughs> yeah. and, we, and, and a chapter about that, and then a chapter about the Zeppelins and the chapter about the development of the British airship system and World War I and all that thing. So we're alternating. So again, here, we're never very far from that present moment, which in this case is we're up in the airship that's doomed and we know it's going to go down and we just don't know when or how. And so in that sense, I guess the, the, that, that structure is somewhat parallel. I just mean like when you have a big hit, and I've had it a couple of times, you have a big hit, it can fuck with your expectations for what all your subsequent work. Oh, you mean in terms of commercial sales? Yeah, or just reception or oh, all like- Oh, it totally are, messes with that. Yeah, yeah, how yeah, do you we, think about that? Wait, well, you can't, you, so I have some friends who, um, you know, they're, they're, they're obsessed, they're, they're obsessed with their own numbers. And yeah. nowadays, of course, we can all go find our numbers. Mm-hmm. And they check it Amazon. twice a day. Yeah. Um, and I don't do that because I don't think that, so if you have a book like, um, Empire of the Summer Moon, which has sold a lot of copies, um, you can start thinking, well, I'm a genius. 
This is the baseline. And then if, you, if you're going to set that up as that standard, because Gwyn is a genius because he sold two and a half million copies, well, okay, then if, if Perfect Pass doesn't sell that well, then Gwyn is an, is an idiot and has written a bad book. Sure. Well, Perfect Pass is my favorite book. <laughs> yeah. But if I, if I were to, because th- th- it's my most original book, but y- you know what I mean? You can't, yeah. if you set yourself up for being a genius because you sold a lot of, you know, whatever your first book on stoicism was, uh, you're, you're setting yourself up for a fall and you cannot believe that because there's, it's, it's, you know, the more, and the more I read about, I just read a biography of Kurt Vonnegut, um, yeah. but it, it's, you, you can be just so rocked and shattered by sure. all of that. If you, if you let that happen and, and it, it, it's 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 inevitable that you're going to try to think that way. I guess. I mean, you're going to that you're going to try to associate your own glory and you know wonderfulness with straight sales or something. And that and that and you look back in history about how how many incredibly great books didn't sell very well. Um, and in fact, looking at Kurt Vonnegut, we're going through Player Piano and Sirens of Titan and God Bless You, Mister Rosewater. Those all sold two thousand copies each. Okay, yeah. so if if we're gonna, if we're going to say well, Kurt Vonnegut, if you, if you set up that standard, then he's not a very good writer, is he? Yeah. You know? But I mean, you know. No, I, my, the book I am most proud of that I think is my best book is the worst selling of all my books. It, like, but I try to think back, okay, the first time I was setting out to write, if you told me that book would sell, that any of my books would sell as many copies as my worst selling book sold, I'd be like, done. I'll yeah. take that trade in two seconds. So exactly. it's, the, the base, it's very hard to keep a reasonable, humble baseline or a, self, a self-sufficient a self baseline that is not determined right. by what other people are doing, what you have done in the past, whatever projection somebody gave you, uh, and to just go, it is what it is, and I'm proud of it because I feel like I did a good job. That's all you can do, I think. I mean, you can, uh, I mean... I do look at, I mean, look at some numbers like print runs, you know, yeah. I mean, the print run here I was happy with. I mean, but, you know, you want to know that your publisher somehow thinks it's going to sell, but it's, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a strange game and it's not one that, that um, as a life, as a career long journalist, I mean, most of my life was as a journalist. Yeah. You're not really playing that game as a journalist. Pre-num- pre's page views. Right. So, yeah. well, now, yeah. now it is, I guess that's true. I didn't, I didn't grow up in that world though. So I'm working yeah. for Time Magazine, and I write a story, and then by Monday uh, night, it's at the bottom of somebody's birdcage, and we move on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and sure. maybe it was the greatest thing in the world, and maybe it wasn't. And you know, I'll get calls from friends saying, "Yeah, that was a great story." Okay, that's it, and you move on. Yeah. Books are a whole different world. But you're right. Yes. The, where nowadays, those poor journalists have to—they're getting rated on how many. Uh, I had this. There was this poor person I, I wrote, worked at the Dallas Morning News with, and she was, um, you know, she was covering up really boring subjects like school boards or something yeah. but she was rated she was she was called on the carpet because she didn't have enough hits on her website yeah. and it was like i thought god anyway I, I didn't really grow up in that world so. yeah there's a story about some some blogger was interviewing robert caro and they were describing there's this thing i don't know if people still use it but it's called chart beat and it would show you not just like how many views your stories got but it would show you how many people were reading it at any moment and it was actually like a speedometer like it would show it would like if it was going well like it, so <laughs> how many there's a thousand people reading it right now ah yeah. they're quitting you know it would show you real time and robert caro's just like aghast he's like how could you <laughs> How could any, this is a guy who spends, you know, a decade of his life writing about the most boring topic you could imagine, you know, the park supervisor of New York City, and it works ultimately, but over a, like, the, there is, but it's also kind of fundamentally irrational, right? Like, what that is relying on is your gut, like, I know what's good, forget what the market says, I got alarm, there, there's also something fundamentally irrational about being self-sufficient in that way and not listening to the evidence or the fact that no one's particularly interested. You, you know, there would never be groundbreaking work if people only looked at what the evidence told them was good. Yeah. It, it's, it's very hard. And there's, uh, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. I often give this example of, of, of getting the, you know, of, and, and I think a lot of writers and maybe you too, I don't know, have, have experienced this is, this is part of what I do. And, um, uh, so, uh, 
my the, uh, this is year, years ago. I have a biography of Stonewall Jackson yeah. called Rebel Yell, which is fo- which has followed a which is also a bestseller up the New York Times for nine or nine or ten weeks bestseller. So I've, I've got two bestsellers mm-hmm. in a row. The other one was a big Texas book too. So I'm in San Antonio with Rebel Yell, mm-hmm. and so I'm not a, I'm not a nothing. I mean, yeah. at this point, I was a nothing in Texas before <laughs> Empire, but I, I sold a bunch in te- and it's about Texas, so Texans like it. I'm in this. I go to the go to the Barnes and Noble at the is it the Pearl Brewery, whatever that brewery north of San Antonio. And there's a there's a Barnes and Noble there. So I walk in, and I think there's I thought there was going to be a book talk of some yeah. kind, but there's you know you realize very quickly there's no chairs set yeah. up for a book talk, but there is a like a a, a desk in the corner that has a sign that says author, yeah. <laughs> literally says author. And there's a little stack of my books on one side of it. So they said, well, okay. There's this like 28-year-old uh, uh, store manager who goes, he goes, well, okay, great. Yeah, so look, we've got a desk for you there. And yeah. Uh, yeah, wait, wait, here's a pen. You want a pen? You need a pen. Okay, get it. So you just go sit at the desk. Yeah. And no one, I, I, I sat there. Yeah. And I sat there and I sat there and a lot of time went by. Yeah. No one came. Finally, finally, a, um, a, a, a lady comes over and she says, uh, and she starts talking to me. She goes, "Well, I love your book." And I go, "Well, thank you." You know, because it really, actually, yeah, important to me at this point that someone liked the book. She goes, "Thank you." We talk for a while, talking. And at some point, she says, "I just have to ask you: Have you written any books other than Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter?" Which, as it turns out, was sitting just behind me in a little right, stack. So right. she had seen the stack and thought, "Oh, here's the guy who wrote Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter." And I said, "Well, you know, vampires aren't haven't really been a big focus of my historical work so far, but." Um, Okay, so that is, and that is only two years removed from me in the green room, sitting in a green room with, um, with Carl Rove at the at whatever that big church, the Methodist Church, is just a, off the in the middle of Austin, right near the Capitol. This yeah. giant, it's got uh, nine hundred capacity in the sanctuary and two hundred if you add the gallery. In this thing, and Carl has drawn you know six or seven hundred people. I'm going, wow, that's incredible. And I go back into the green room. I come out because I'm following him speaking. It's full. Yeah, it's and I did say hello, Cleveland too. But uh, <laughs> it's full, and there's there's people out in front. Okay, so which Sam Gwynn? Yeah, you know, yeah, what, I I still I've never had any any moment like that in my life where this book was just an exploding bestseller and I hit it just exactly at the right moment and I came out on stage and went you have got to be kidding me yeah. okay which Sam Gwynn is the real one is it the right. one who is sitting in the little corner and no one knows who he is the pathetic little sad author guy or the glorious Hello Cleveland guy yeah uh, and I did say it with a British accent too so I I did an event like that at Barnes and Noble in Hawaii. <laughs> and uh, it was the same thing. They, you know, they made How all these. How did you problems. go to, like a book tour to Hawaii? I, it was like I was <laughs> supposed to go to Hawaii, and so they were like, "Well, do you want to do this event while you're there?" And they could yeah. be like a tax write off or something. I was like, "Sure." And so, you know, I just expect them to take care of it, and they take care of it. And I get there, and there's not even like a poster, and the manager doesn't. And one one person came, and you know. You have to sit there. You have this sense that your work is being reached, it's reaching people. You have some sense that you're good at what you're doing. And then there's this public reminder of the world's indifference to you yes. a- a- entirely. And then there has to be some part of you that goes, this is not true, right? <laughs> like you've just gotten overwhelming evidence that the le- the Zeppelin is a bad idea. It will crash. <laughs> in the- and you're like, no, I know better. I'm going to keep going. And then, yeah, a couple years later, you're doing it at, you know, some so in front of some huge audience or you breaking these sales records or whatever. There, That's the tricky part is like, you have to be a little irrational, but not, too irrational. You have to have a right. little bit that you could leading the target, faking it till you make it. But if you fake it till you make it too much, you're Elizabeth Holmes or something, right? Like <laughs> exactly. the the, the it, you're you're really playing with fire or hydrogen or something. Yeah. There, it's 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 the ego, the pomposity of like the world wants to hear what I have to say is is a very dangerous thing, but also a critical ingredient to doing it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you have to have that ego in order to do it, but and then you have to survive when so apparently no one cares. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so yes. it's like interesting. So you, so what you just said though, your your description was so you've been through it. All authors I know, yeah. great and small, have been through this. Yeah, and uh, uh, 
you know, I was, in fact, I was talking to one, I won't name her, she's a very popular uh, woman writer, Texas woman writer, but she was telling me about how she's been touring, tours all the time and goes to all these places. And I say, so so do you draw crowds everywhere? And she says, no, sometimes I have two or three people. And yeah. I say, well, why do you do that? And her answer was because I'm teaching them how to, um, teaching the bookstore how to sell the books, which is a pretty smart sure. answer. But on the other hand, there she's, I mean, you, we all would know yeah. this name. She's yeah. a big deal. Yeah. And so she had adjusted her ego. Yes. I mean, I'm sure she's sure. got an ego that's just as big as all of our egos, but she had adjusted it. Yes. To a world in which it wasn't all just high tide and green grass and glory for her, you know. And well, maybe it's, uh, obviously I wrote a book about this, but the, the difference between ego and confidence, the confidence of going, whether 10 people come or 1,000 people come, it doesn't say anything about me. It doesn't say anything right. about the book. Sometimes you have a good audience. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes it's your fault. Sometimes it's the bookstore's fault. Sometimes it's the publisher's fault. Right, exactly. Um, you know, and I just had one at Barnes & Noble here not that long ago, and I, the publisher had done it as a ticketed event as opposed to just, you know, anyone. And then I had to remember, oh, wait, I'm not even doing this for the crowd. I'm doing it because... Barnes and Noble did this special edition of the book. Like I'm just supporting the account. Yeah, like right. I promised them I'd do some stuff, so I'm doing some stuff. And I have to go, it is what it is. Like you have to figure out what you're measuring and why you're measuring it. Cause you you can so easily default to the vanity metric of like, am I getting this stuff that other people say is important? Press and media attention being a great example. Right. Like my best selling books have gotten the least amount of attention and my works that have gotten the most amount of attention have sold the least because there's really true yeah because like when i write about media stuff i get lots of media attention oh i see yeah yeah right and and, right there's and those books sell but there's not the same word of mouth as if you do a book that just does something for people and at the end of the day word of mouth is not sexy but it's the only thing that pays the bills there's another thing too that is um i one of my favorite movies almost irrationally is is la la land Mm mm-hmm Partly because it it was filmed all around where I used to live, a part in of downtown. Boston. Well, Griffith Park. Oh. The uh, I just took my kids on Angels Los- Flight. Oh yeah, okay, and they Angels loved it. Flight. Yeah. It's wonderful. Yeah. Um, but yeah, a lot of the kind of the atmospheric stuff yeah. in Hollywood and the Shakespeare Bridge and Griffith Park and all that stuff. But anyway, it's a great movie. But one of one of the 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 big song and dance numbers is called "Someone in the Crowd," mm. and the point of it was that. In, you're in Hollywood, everybody's trying to make it right. I mean, you never have any idea of who the person, who's, who may help you. Yeah. I mean, my whole career is just, it goes down to individual people helping me. At, sure. I mean, who somebody who bought, the editor of Harper's who bought my first article, it's a person. Yeah. It's like somewhere, and, he, and the, the point of this song, this long, big song and dance is that um, you don't know who that's going to be and you don't know when it's going to be. That some, there's someone here in this crowd who can right. open all the doors for you. And the great thing is, so Emma Stone, who plays, who won the Academy Award for the role, um, has a one-woman show mm-hmm. in Hollywood and six people come to it. And yeah. she's crushed. Yeah. And she's she's been failing. She's been going to auditions and nobody's hiring. And she goes to this thing and that's it. She says, that's it. I'm leaving. And so yeah. she leaves. She, she goes home. And so sometime in the next week, whatever, the, the phone rings, and there was one casting agent of the six yeah, who's like the big casting agent who thought it was the greatest sure. show she'd ever seen yeah. and immediately casts her in this great big thing. The woman becomes a huge success. But the point being, that was all that mattered. And so yeah. that whenever you start to think volume, yeah, um, I mean, I was at a bookstore once where there was like 10 people there and... And there were three people that I met that actually changed things in my life. I mean, I, yeah. who, I, I'm not saying they made my book into a bestseller, but sure. they, but who, who, you 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 can't assume that that 600 is better than 11 necessarily. I yes. mean, you know, it, it maybe maybe sell more books, but um, anyway. It's, and you also it, it, can't it, assume success now is the same. Like, would you rather sell 10,000 books? Uh, in one year or a thousand books a year <laughs> indefinitely, right? Like, would you rather the books still be in print? Yeah, yeah. It's um, a and, good question. And and I think a lot of people, well, it's funny, right? It's like um, you sell 10,000 books in a week, you hit a bestseller list. Yeah. You sell a thousand books a week for a whole year, you will never touch a bestseller list, but you will have sold many, many, many more copies. Yep. And if you can sell that many copies, or if you can consistently sell that many copies for that amount of time, chances are you're gonna keep selling copies. And so yeah. we often uh, overestimate uh, or over uh, uh, index being 
c- the concentration right. of success and reach um, when really it's a, you know, Empire of the Summer Moon that it continues. That you want to get over the hump and become perennial and classic. You want to be on the nonfiction classics section or whatever, or the dads and grads section. You want to be right. in that conversation, not the everyone's talking about this book right now. Sometimes the the one that everyone's talking about, they're still talking about, but often the reason they're talking about it is because it's very much of the moment it's and that ephemeral, moment's yeah. going to fade. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. it's uh, Speaking of uh, great books, I was um, I just read uh, Fahrenbach's um, Comanches. Oh, you did? I, I read the whole thing because I've uh-huh. read Empire of the Summer Moon and I've read Lone Star and, I, and I, I like his Korean War book too, which is also incredible. Fahrenbach. Yes. Yeah. Um, Good I, Texas writer, San Antonio writer. But- that's another like the the not pomposity, but the confidence to make the sweeping statements that he makes about generations of people or mm-hmm. civilizations. That is the double edged sword of doing any sort of creative work or any kind of work where it's like it probably is so easy to get your head stuck up your own ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Fahrenbach was uh yeah, I mean he was <sighs> Did you so, meet him? No, I never did, and I came close at one point. In fact, he he and I were supposed to be on a podium together somewhere. I think, and he died, mm. or he got, or he got very sick, yeah. and then he died. He, he was older, um, but uh, yeah, he was. Uh, so, from my point of view, he was the. I think that book was this nineteen seventy four book or something. Yeah. So, I mean, my, I looked at that when I was doing my book. I thought, well, okay, that's it's so much time has passed yeah. here. I, yeah, I can legitimately undertake the same. The same topic as T.R. Fahrenbach, but uh, yeah, he's uh, he's there aren't very many of him. Yeah, if if you look at historians, you know the kind of the Doby. I don't know, I mean the, whoever those, bet whatever Webb, Doby, you know Fahrenbach. There aren't that many of them around the mid century. Yeah, the hard the hard part for me in Comanches was the the Lone Star book is so good. His reconstruction is so bad you know, so preposterously of its time, mm-hmm. lost cause. It yes. makes it hard for me to read the subsequent stuff and not go, like, how do I separate yeah, yeah. this from that? Yeah, no, it's true. Um, but but the ability to s- reduce sweeping periods of human history and sum them up in a in a sentence or two is, is both a superpower and... Uh, Probably also playing with fire. Who Fahrenbach? Just I mean, for any, like to. I be, mean, he's good at be, that. He's yeah, good at he's that, and he also there are all pages in his, when I should run him down, and yeah. I don't. I, I well, he's one of the reasons I wrote my book. But there were pages where I go, okay, this isn't right. That's what I mean. But there's yes. but he has the ability to look at the big picture that yes. is very rare. You yes. know, and and there are some stuff that's just flat brilliant. You go, God, you know, n- nobody wrote that. Nobody looked at yes. it that way. So, um, but yeah. Interesting historian. Well, and and yeah, the there is, I think, probably a tendency in historians to get very bogged down in facts. Just like, let me give you this, this after this after this. And he he understands narrative and human nature and the sort of the the theatrics of it in a way. Like, how do you make a a seven hundred page book about Texas interesting? You you it can't be. Here's a bunch of facts about Texas. Right, you right. have to understand the essence of what's happening at a sort of like a Thucydidean level, which he yeah. is so so good at. I read just a lot of stuff, particularly that I have to do for research. That's just all forest, all trees, and no forest. You know, mm-hmm. and you never, and you just never get the step back. Yes, it's just this obsessive. You know, and then this happened, and then that happened, and then they went here, and then this, and this battle was won. And I mean, you just go in the Civil War, a lot, a lot of Civil War books are like that. And you just go, I mean, there's never, okay, step back now and tell me what that meant. Yes. What did, you know, Second Manassas or Second Bull Run mean? Yeah. As opposed to just, well, then he went here, and then so and so, and then the Ninth of Georgia attacked, and then, I mean, it's just on and on forever. Yeah. It's just a form of insanity yeah. in a way. It's just this undifferentiated nothingness that's coming by you. I mean, really, it's a form of, of, of craziness. Um, and I, I, I see a lot of it. <laughs> well, your your hate... Civil War book is so good for the same reason that Bruce Catton is so good and uh, this hallowed ground is so good, where, where someone is able to, to actually get to what happened and why and what it means and what it says about people 
that's what's that's what one of those books does. And you compare that. You, what's interesting about the Civil War is that you, you have a like so rarely do you get a bunch of people writing about the same finite amount of stuff, right? And so with the Civil War, you actually do have like you can you can you have a control group of like you have all the people that did it badly, and then here's someone doing it well, and. When you when you see it done, what you're like, yeah, this is just operating at another level. That's why Catton was the breakthrough. Yeah, I mean, in in the two books, I would say Stillness at Appomattox and This Hallow Ground. Yeah. Those two books, uh, Stillness won the Pulitzer in 1954. I mean, it was he was the first one to really do that well. Douglas Southall Freeman was good and all, but he, he, he was, the books were dense and they yeah. were heavy and they mm -hmm. were a bit academic, but. Catton just gave gives you the, the the meaning of he's good on detail too, but he's going to step back and you're going to see what the Army of the Potomac really looked like or whatever it was. I mean, he's just he's just brilliant, and uh, yeah. he's the he's got to be the greatest to ever do it, right? And he's the reason, yeah. And he, I think, is if 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 whenever you hear someone, you always hear someone say that, oh, I love the Civil War. Some yeah. my dad loves the Civil Wars. The reason will ultimately go back to Bruce Catton. Yes, I mean Bruce Catton is who, is who made that generation of Americans go, oh my God, this is really interesting stuff. It's yeah. just not, you know, and, he, and also he wasn't in that kind of lost cause school that dominated history in the early yes. 20th century. He wasn't whatever they call him, the, cent the centennial school, but he, he wasn't in that school either. He, yes. was, he, was, he was relatively even-handed. Well, I think it's because he's a Midwesterner yeah. and then uh, he's just, he, he understands the South without... Uh, sympathizing with the, the fundamental argument or yeah. something, and which is a very important dance that I think a more reactionary uh, writer today would have trouble doing. Um, like it's ultimately clear where his sympathies lie, which is good. They're on right, the right, right side of it. Yeah. But then you you do understand why the other people were doing what they're doing. And in fact, it makes it, makes it much more damning ultimately um, because you understand them as people, um, and it's yeah, it's just yeah. the best. Yeah, that's right. Catton was Michigan, right? He yeah, Michigander. I just read his his book about his boyhood in Michigan. Oh yeah, that was really good. I, I've um, never read it. Yeah, I was trying to see if he'd written about anything other than the Civil War because I would be very excited to read that. He wrote a book with his son about like war, like defense contractors during World War II, but oh, yeah? I, can't, I haven't brought myself to read it. So I mean, I'm sure it's great, but <laughs> I, I can't I think what good. I've read is there was the Mr. Lincoln's War trilogy, then there yeah. was the Stillness and Hallow. I think those are like the five that, of his yeah. books that I've read. So well, every, one, every time I'm like, I really cannot read another book about the Civil War, and then I'll read one of his, and I'll be like, oh, I can. Uh, there's, there's, something more, there's something more here. He's just uh, incredible. Anything else we should talk about? You got anything? No, I, I mentioned one more. So yes. the, people ask me where the book came from, and what what's the, this is an, an, another writer yeah. who does this brilliantly. So there's you ever heard of James Morris? No. Okay, James Morris became Jan Morris, who's one of the first, I think, trans historians. Oh, a big name trans recently, or like how, how long? No, ago? let's see. So uh, I would have think she died. Um, I would have said maybe ten years ago, and was a historian active in the you know 60s 70s 80s I guess possibly the 50s too but um I I, I don't maybe born in 19 10 or 1920, maybe born in 1920 or something. Anyway, actually wrote for Texas Monthly at oh. one point, but anyway, James Morris under that name wrote a, <clears throat> a trilogy called Pax Britannica Ooh. of the British Empire. And the third one was called Farewell the Trumpets. And it's so good, it just knocks me down. If you, I mean, if you, if you were to pick up, it, 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 talk about the big picture. Talk yeah. about the genius for tying it all together, stepping back and saying, this is what it all means. And so somewhere in the middle of there, there was a three-page run on R101. Wow. And, it, and it, what he did was he, he tied this whole thing to kind of the decline of the British Empire, about how they were trying to save themselves and that this crash was emblematic of the end of the, I mean, it just, it, it was brilliant. And I, I read it. And I said, you know, I, I do what, you know, all you know, trained historians do. I, I Googled it and Amazoned it right away, you know, to see, like, how many books have yeah. come out yeah, sure. about R101? Because Morris was writing 40 years ago or something. And uh, 
really almost nothing. I mean, something in 82, but it was not written by a, you know, it was a lot of research, but not really, really written by a professional writer. And, and, uh, uh, anyway, so that wh where I end up, I'm, I'm the only guy with this idea, that's for sure. And the only reason I think is because no one else reads, uh, <laughs> James Jan Morris. Well, but, I'm definitely going to read that. Oh, try just, just pick up a little bit, uh, or anybody listening to this, pick up a, just a little bit of Farewell to Trumpets. It's the okay. third one. Should I read but, the whole three? Well, I would say okay. read the whole okay. thing. It's 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 brilliant writing. Yeah. I mean, there aren't that many historians that kind of knock me down. Catton is yeah. one. Morris is another. Um, anyway, go ahead. But Sorry. that's your superpower, right? Because Empire of the Summer Moon is basically the Quanta Parker story from Comanches. Right. Um, the uh, 1865 book, uh, uh, Him of the Republic, is basically a similar arc as one of the Bruce right. Catton books. And then you've... It's you're exactly reading this... the arc of Stillness at Appomattox. Yes. I, except I that, he, except yeah. that he sticks with Army of the Potomac and I go... And then in this case, you you read these this three pages and you go, that should be a whole book. You're, yeah. you're, you're like, you're, your writing is like, you know, when you're like on a map uh, on your phone <laughs> and you go... <laughs> or... Is it, yeah, you're zooming. You're zooming in. Zooming. That's yeah. a, and you're like, that's a whole book right there. Yeah. And I, I'm going to put a bunch of color on that. You know what's another incredible book I just read? Have you read Anne Rose's book on Pontius Pilate? No. Another thing where you're like, she just goes. Shh, Is there I'm, enough research to justify? Well, a book she starts that? the book and she's like, there's basically like one tablet. <laughs> there's the Bible. <laughs> Uh, which is she's not treating as a historical source necessarily, and then there's like an aqueduct and like a couple letters. There's like Tacitus mentions it, and there's like yeah. a couple things. But she draws in every play, and she's she's talking about not just what Pontius Pilate was, but what everyone thought he oh, was. Oh, the how cultural the, history the, of the, the. But it's so it's a, it, it was one of those books where I could read like three pages, and I'm like. I'm going to take a break now. That's so, there's so much in these three pages. I have to like come back to it. Even with Incredible. the scarcity of research uh, in, or of primary insane. stuff on it. Well, have you read Cleopatra's Daughter? Uh, no. Some new, some book that came out. And it was the same thing. There, yeah. There's, there's, oh, there's about that much about it. Right. And some of the reviews have said that, well, this is really stretching it as far as you can possibly stretch it. I mean, where you just load it up with backstory and backstory well, and just, backstory. Well, just, she, like, okay, obviously, I write about the Stoics. So Seneca, I'm thinking about all the time. It never occurred to me that, so Seneca writes this letter, Seneca's letters to Lucilius, right? Lucilius, his friend, has the same job as Pontius Pilate, just in a different province, oh. right? Seneca's brother, Gaio, also judges a case, like Pontius Pilate, not of Jesus, on St. Paul. And it's like, Oh yeah, so there we don't know what's so there are actually parallels happening that you here, can look at. but yes, yeah, we yeah. we can know so much uh -huh. about. And you're just when you just read someone that just they're like, this is my story, and I'm going to zoom in, I'm mm -hmm, going to give you mm -hmm. all of it, and you're like, how did you manage to get 300 pages out of you know yeah. three days? And that that there's a there's a genius to that that's like you just wow. Is the title Pontius Pilate? I think so, or it might okay. just be called Pontius, but. Uh, and um, she's the I, she writes the obituaries for the Economist. <laughs> That's her, jo her day job. Yeah, <laughs> what a great job. Yeah, uh, cool. That's awesome. great. Well, this was incredible. Thanks well, thank again. Thank you, Ryan. Of course.